Today, 16 million children have been diagnosed with learning and behavior disorders. For quite some time, I've been very concerned about what's happening with children. I wrote a book last year called Sad Dog, Happy Dog, How Poor Posture Affects Your Child's Life and What You Can Do About It. It's very difficult because we don't really understand the cause. Uh, and there may be multiple causes, but one cause really stands out for the fact that it has been basically thoroughly overlooked, and that is the natural design of the human body. But this situation is complicated by the fact that what we think is, quote, good posture in our part of the world is a, is a misunderstanding. A lot of information, a lot of visual images, a lot of words. I don't want you to feel like you have to try to remember the details of this, but there are five main points that I hope you will take from this presentation. Number one, design affects function. Number two, disrupting the design impacts function. Increasingly, children are not maintaining this natural design. Returning to the natural design improves health. And number five, change is possible on a societal level. So it's important to remember that as humans, we are part of the natural world. Whatever your uh, you know, philosophy and religious tradition is, it still doesn't matter. We have one foot in the natural world, and that's our physical self. And as physical creatures of nature, we are governed by the same laws that govern everything else in our world. So one of the ways we're kind of confused about this is in our understanding of what strength is. So this is a woman in Bali. She's a small woman. She has got a ginormous load of rocks on her head, and she's walking up a hill. So how come she can carry all those rocks on her head and she doesn't have that kind of strength that that guy has? Her kind of strength and his kind of strength are very different. Her kind of strength is natural. It's just innate. It's who she is. His kind of strength is unnatural. It's artificial. He wasn't born to be that way. So she's not that unusual, actually. Some places in the world, you find a remarkable number of women carrying heavy things on their heads. And what you notice about these women is that they all have long spines, and they're all moving with ease. You don't see them struggling under that heavy load. It just seems like the most natural thing in the world for them to be carrying those um, heavy items on their heads. So here's a little bit about how this works. Again, we're just governed by the same laws that govern everything, including physics, engineering, architecture. So when you go to build a house, you create a foundation. You make sure your foundation is solid and level. And then on top of that foundation, you put up wall studs. You do the framework of support for the, for the house. So you put up these wall studs and these cross beams and then a heavy roof. You align these posts, these studs, along the vertical axis of gravity, or in carpentry builders talk, plumb line. The skeleton, it's hard to see because it's such a collection of odd-shaped bones, but the human skeleton is no exception. It is also the framework of support, just like the framework of that building. It just so happens that every healthy, well-developing human toddler figures this out. And it, this is what makes it possible for all these children to carry either siblings on their backs or heavy loads of water on their heads. And it's not harmful as long as their bones are aligned and the load is right on top of that line so that the, the forces, not just the weight of the load, but the forces of gravity are distributed through this line. 
American children used to stand on two legs that were vertical pillars. This is what most legs look like today. So you can see that architecturally there would be a problem for the building above that. You could say that babies at this point are happy dogs. They've got their tails wagging out behind them. And when I work with children, this is how I help them understand the position of the pelvis. Unfortunately, a lot of children go from this to this in a very short amount of time. And if the adage is true that you're only as young as your spine, he's a very old man. Not everybody ages, though, in such a collapsed way. At one time, this is what children looked like. They sat on an aligned pelvis. They were happy dogs. The incidence of autism, just autism alone, was 1 in 10,000 when children looked like this. Today, children look like this. What you see with sad dogs is this backward tilt of the pelvis the tucking under of the tail, the sitting on the tailbone, as opposed to sitting on the front of the sit bones. This baby comes into the world and has all the working parts, has the brain and all the cells and the neurons and everything that it needs. It's just that they aren't really functioning yet. And that's what the baby's job is going to be in the coming months. On its back, it just does these sort of reflexive movements. There's kicking. There's the flailing of the arms. Lying on its stomach, they're kicking their legs out behind them, and they're elongating their spines. They're developing the strength to lift this head up. It makes a lot of sense. These synapses are happening, all this firing of these neurons. I think what's really happening here is that they are turning on the nervous system. Because remember, the nervous system is not just the brain. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord that travels through the spine. When you look at this uh, diagram of the spinal cord, doesn't it make sense that it should be an aligned open channel uh, throughout our lives? Babies actively exercising at this age. I'm, it's like an exercise program. It's like a whole routine. And they just do this on instinct. It's just the unfolding, the natural unfolding of this physical process. It takes aligned legs. It takes this quality of vitality and enlivenment and connection to our nature to be a young child and to be able to carry that kind of a load on your head and to just do it as if it was nothing. That quality of enlivenment is missing in a lot of children in our country today. And why has this happened? Well, we don't know for sure, but there are some trends. Uh, we happen to put babies a lot on their backs, more than we used to. In 1992, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics recommended that babies be placed on their backs to sleep because they believed that that might have something to do with um, the incidence of SIDS. I think it started a, a kind of a, a way of thinking like, oh, the baby's supposed to be on their back. Maybe not just when they're asleep, but on their back. So we see also lots and lots of devices that we put our babies in, seemingly innocuous. Uh, it's the repetition, it's the pattern. So they spend a lot of time in this position. The seat dips in the back like the bucket seat in a car, like a lot of desk chairs in some classrooms that force the pelvis into this tucked backward tilt. Sitting like that once in a while is not a problem, but sitting like that repetitively, habitually, is a very big problem. We have become so concerned about developing our children's minds and their cognitive 
their ability for higher learning, that we are beginning to deprive them more and more of just the natural unfolding of being a body, not just a mind. And what they're finding now is that a number of children, when put on their stomachs, immediately roll themselves back over to their backs. They don't want to be on their stomachs because they haven't had that natural progression. So they, get, they immediately go back to their backs because it's what's familiar. What's familiar is comfortable. They don't have the strength to hold their heads up. And so in a matter of very few months, they have sort of lost this urge to tone themselves and strengthen themselves and build their nervous system. This is a graph that we've put together, a collaboration of a number of health organizations and educational institutions. This shows the climb of autism from the 1970s up to 2009. It's pretty dramatic. And so what can we see from what some of the trends have been? Well, in 1962, the first car seat was invented to protect a child's safety in a car. Up until then, I'm, you know, I'm not making any judgment here. I mean, you have a car, you have to constrain the baby. You have to protect the baby. It's just the accumulation of patterns and trends. About the same time, we were starting to get infant seats and the little bouncers and the baby swings. These things started getting used more. Then in 1984, New York State passed the first car seat law. And very soon after that, all the other states passed car seat laws. laws. And in 1992 and 1994 was the Back to Sleep campaign. So along the way, there were lifestyle changes, shopping malls, and um, various things that seemed to lend themselves well to increased use of strollers. The other thing that ha was sort of an outcome of the car seat law was that they came up with car seats that had handles. So you would drive to your destination. When you got there, you'd take the baby and carry the baby in the carrier. So now the car seats, remember, in all of these things, the babies are in a somewhat reclining position. So the overall trend is that babies are spending more and more time on their backs, on the back part of the pelvis, compressing, and less and less time on their tummies, lengthening, opening, elongating and building the nervous system, that channel. At one time, it was common for babies to be carried in most cultures all over the world on every continent. What was common to all of them was that the baby was carried in such a way that the spine was long. The integrity of the spine was maintained in the way that the baby was carried. And fortunately, this is a growing trend in America today, as more and more mothers and fathers are carrying their babies with nice long spines. So what do we do? Well, when babies are awake from the very earliest age, I think they should be on their stomachs so that they begin to interact with the world in this way so that they begin to experience what's called ground reaction force. It's an actual exchange of energy between our body and the earth, the earth of which we are a part. If you throw a bouncy ball down on the ground, it will bounce. If you want that ball to bounce higher, you throw it down harder. You connect it more deeply with the ground and the reaction the opposite action is equal to that. Cats jumping up onto a shelf will crouch and leap. If the shelf is higher, they'll crouch lower. They'll draw up whatever that is, and they'll leap even higher. So these little bodies are designed to begin to work and experience that kind of response to the earth through their bodies. So we don't want to rob babies from developing this. There are a number of simple exercises that you can do with children to develop this. It all comes down to aligning the bones and engaging the deep core 
deep internal corset that helps to support this. So it's an interplay between the bones and the muscles, the musculoskeletal system, that supports the healthy functioning of the nervous system. You'll get this elongation through the torso here, this opening of what is often experienced as like a jammed highway. You know, you've got this super highway, which is the, the spinal cord, and um, when it's compressed, when it's distorted, it's like instead of the s however many lanes you have, the traffic jams up. And you want to really elongate through the back, and this constantly is developing this core strength. You can see which group is the picture of good health. Which group has a much better chance of not having a whole list of aches and pains and disorders and chronic problems? There are things we can do. There's ways you can teach children how to stand, how to sit, how to bend, how to walk. You can teach children how to tie their shoe, how to lift something heavy. There's just a whole way that um, this can be incorporated into uh, children's lives. As parents, we can encourage our schools to learn more about uh, natural alignment, encourage them to incorporate this into the curriculum. I mean, it's a one, I've taught this in classrooms. Children love this. They love learning how their bodies work, provided that the adults are on board willing to learn ourselves. There is an enormous aspect of learning how to inhabit one's body in this natural way that involves mindfulness. There is a wonderful new movement happening in American schools and they're finding, and it's no surprise, they're finding that when you encourage children to just sit quietly with their eyes closed, focusing on their breath, they become more calm, they settle down. They um, are better able to focus, they're better able to learn, and the children themselves report that they feel happier, that they like doing this, that it just is a big help to them. But unfortunately, a lot of the children are sitting on the floor or sitting at their desks and they're being mindful like this. So if they're getting the benefit of doing it that way, imagine the benefit that they would get from being mindful if they were able to get oxygenated blood into their brain through open blood vessels and such. When we bombard young children and babies with stimulation and we're just trying to teach them and develop their minds, we sort of deprive them of something very important, which is the opportunity of just quiet and opportunities to just uh, develop this internal quietude, which I think we all know is a very essential part of being human. I think we're pretty much wrapped up. Thank you so much.